Well, good morning again. Um, what I got on my heart to share with you guys today is, is kind of stirred off of, you know, we, we went through um, and looked at Genesis 3. We saw the fall of man. We saw the prophecy of the Savior coming. And then we went through and looked at the Savior, what he did on our behalf. And uh, are we thankful that that plan of God was instituted and uh, we now can stand here in right standing with our Father. But one of the things that I noticed when you get into that, that portion of Genesis is that uh, the devil kind of has a, a playbook, I'm going to call it. There's things that he uses against humanity, and he started out in the garden, and he used them against Adam and Eve, and, and because the devil cannot create, God is the creator, all he can really do is deceive distort, twist, pervert, lie. Remember, Scripture says he's the father of lies. And, and so what he does is he takes these things that are of God and natural things for humans, and he twists them and distorts them and deceives with them, and, and he lies to us about them. He lies to us about the father. That's what he did with Adam and Eve. He came in and said, did God really say? Is that really what God said? And he got them to, to question what God had said and, and then move away from what God had said into unbelief and then took, a, took um, and ate of the fruit, and here we are today. And so what I want to do today is, is, is kind of like uh, when a, a football team has to play another football team, they study the, the um, video of their games to try and learn what their game plan is, which player does what on one particular game call and so on and so forth to try and get an idea of how to defeat them. And they spend hours and hours and hours studying video. And so what I want to do today is I want to look back at this portion of Genesis and see what the devil did and, and what his plays are, because there's actually three things that he uses, and he, and through the course of time, he has a lot of different ways that he implements them. And, of course, he can, unfortunately, kind of cater them towards us individually because uh, he watches us. You know, we have to be careful, and I'm going to get into this later, but, you know, Scripture talks about that we get snared by the words of our mouth. See, he can't read our minds, and he doesn't know the future, but he can hear and see, and I think too often uh, we help him, and we'll look at that and, and try and get to that um, so we don't do that. That's really my desire is that we, we look in his playbook, see what they are, familiarize ourselves with them, and then when he tries to use that play against us, we recognize it and reject it, okay? And there are actually three fairly uh, distinct things that we'll recognize as we go. So I'm going to read Genesis 3, uh, 1 through 16. It goes by pretty quick. Um, now the serpent was more crafty, subtle, skilled, in deceit than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made. And the serpent, Satan, said to the woman, can it really be that God has said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees of the garden except the fruit from the tree which is in the middle of the garden. God said, you shall not eat from that nor touch it, otherwise you will die. But the serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die, for God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open." That is, you will have greater awareness, and you will look, and you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to look at, and a tree to be desired in order to make one wise and insightful, she took some of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of the two of them were opened, that is, their awareness increased, and they knew that they were naked, and they fastened fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So we see here that there were three things that 
the devil used in his deceit of what was going on, and, and generally it's, it's spoken of lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Those are the three main plays that the devil has used through all of human history against humanity. And unfortunately, they've had the opportunity to be very successful. Because, see, what happens is, is, you know, when she looked, it scripture says that it was good for food. They looked at the apple, and Eve thought, hey, that would be good for food. Well, what does humanity need on a daily basis? Well, we need food. We need substance. That's what keeps us alive. And so it was a natural thing for her to be desirous of food. The only problem was that food was not to be touched or ate. The second one is, is the lust of the eye. She said it was a delight to look at. It was very beautiful. It, it, it drew her in with, it, with its delight. And so she took of it. And the third thing is, is the pride of life, is it makes one wise and insightful. And, and so God had already given them his wisdom. They already had the mind and the intellect of God. They were made in his image. But see, the enemy came along and convinced them that God was not providing all of their needs, that God was holding out and keeping something from them. And, of course, what he used to get them to believe that was this one thing that they were not to involve themselves in. So here they had this whole garden, okay, and everything they had need of was in the garden. They lacked no good thing. But there was one thing that, that they had been around. It's not like this was the first time they saw the tree. This was the first time that they saw the tree with the deception of what the tree could do for them. And so because of the deception, because of the natural things that God had built into them, the, the desire to eat, the, the beautifulness of the garden, and, and all of the wisdom that went along with it, they believed that they lacked something and that they would have to provide some things for themselves. And that's really one of the greatest tricks that he uses on us is that he can get us to believe that God is withholding something from us and that we need to somehow provide that part for ourselves. And, and it's interesting because if you think of the grace plus message, you're saved by grace plus something else. See, that's that same lie and deceit, that God didn't do enough at the cross for us that we need to somehow now involve ourselves in our salvation or the maintaining of our salvation or, or producing what salvation has produced for us. And then he gets us off track out there striving to get what already belongs to us. And, and so we see that even with us, because so often we can say, well, you know, if I'd have been in the garden, I wouldn't have fallen for that. Well, it may be a lot easier if you had the devil's playbook, and then you could say, well, let's see, page three, page five. Nope, I see you. And that's what I'm hoping to do here today with us, is that we get the playbook, and that when he comes to us, even though we're not in the garden, we still get the opportunity to reject the lie, reject the deceit, reject, reject the deception, and, and know that it is finished. But scripture says we have all things pertaining to life and godliness. And all just means all. But if you and I don't believe that, if we don't adhere to that truth, then guess what? The devil's going to be able to come along and try and convince us we're lacking something. And then we fall for it. And so because these tactics have been successful on a creation that has a free will to choose, he is not needed to change the tactics. See, that's the interesting part is God made us free moral agents. We're not wet robots. We're individually made, individually created, and he gave us free will. 
And we have to be responsible with that free will. And the devil knows we have free will. And what he wants us to do is take our will and, and change it from the will of God for us to what we want for us. And we end up in this same situation. Um, so when we study the devil's playbook, we, say, we see how he deceives, distorts, twists, and perverts. See, that's all he can do. He cannot create anything. And he cannot make us do anything. Okay? When we're on that path that God has put us on, the devil can't come and push us off the path. He's, he's, he's been uh, made a, a quadriplegic by the work of Jesus Christ. Okay? But what happens is, is he has these deceitful, deceptive ways, and, and he is off the path, and, and it's like a, a, a big bass fish down there in the water, and all of a sudden that lure shimmers a little bit, and it sees it and goes for it. Well, that's all the devil can do with us, is put these shiny things out there to try and get us to look that direction. And, and as we look, it, it has been effective through the years. And this is one of those areas that I, I talked about, is that what happens is, is we think, well, how does he know what lure to use for me? I, I'm not a fisherman, but, I, but I've been around long enough to hear the stories and kind of comprehend fishing, that you have to figure out what those fish are desiring that day, whether it's a green one or a blue one or a shiny one or one that skips or one that floats. Or, you know, I don't, like I said, I don't know all about that, but I know that those people that know how to change their lure know how to catch fish. Okay, And, and this is one of those areas that when we understand that it's the lust of the eyes, it's the lust of the flesh, it's the pride of life, and of course, all of his deceptions generally come in a lust of, okay? So God has given us natural desires, okay? And what a lust is, is a lust is that natural desire twisted, taken out of context and used improperly. It's perverted. Very good word to use. It's a perverted aspect of what God has, has given us and because it's a natural desire for us, it's, it's imperative that we understand what it is and what God's plan is for it, okay? But the enemy likes to sit off to the side and, and flash that lure. And I think one of the reasons that he knows what lure to use, and I, I alluded to this earlier, is he listens to the words of our mouth. He sees our activities. He knows where we're trusting God and where we're not. You know, Scripture says, out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. You know, and, and we talked about how did God create all that we see? He spoke it into existence, okay? What did Jesus tell them to do to the mountain? Speak to it, that it would be removed. And so we need to get a, a, a good handle on what we say. You know, Scripture says that life and death are in the power of the tongue and those that will eat the fruit of what we say. And so the devil can't come in and read your mind, but he certainly can listen to the words of your mouth. So, for example, you know, let's say that the advertisement comes on and it says, well, it's flu season. Well, if you say, oh, I better get to the drugstore and get my flu medication. See, he knows where your faith is at. Your faith is in the medication. It's not in the Savior that died for your healing. You know, and, and, and there's just little things like that that sometimes I'm not sure that we pay close enough attention to when we speak out things. You know, it may be one of those things that, that you know, something is said and you agree to it. You know, you might say something like, well, I always catch the flu. Just little things like that, that it's, it's not so much that it's going to change our relationship with God, but what it does is it, it feeds information to the deceiver. So then he comes along and deceives us with that which we have almost given him uh, the information to, 
And so what he'll do is he'll take these, these natural desires and twist them and take them out of context. And, and so we see that God created us with desires for food and water and shelter and sex and comfort and all of these things. Yep, I said sex in church. But isn't it interesting that these are the areas that the enemy comes along and says, well, did God really say that he'd provide a mate for you? Did God really say that he would provide food for you? Did God really say that he would provide shelter for you? And if you don't answer with the affirmative, yes, God did say, then what happens is you start to think, well, he did say that, but... Maybe I need to go, and maybe I need to start, and maybe I need to. And, and those things may be true, but they need to be led by the Spirit of God and not by the deception of the enemy. Okay? That's why it says if we keep in step with the Spirit, we will not fulfill the desires of our flesh. Okay? And, and, and our, we live in this world, in this world system, is part of this fall, it's part of this deception. It, it, it is a deceptive system that wants us to believe it can provide for us. But when we realize that that deceptive system can't, it's, it's a placebo. It looks like it will, but it won't. And the sad part is we spend so much time trying to find uh, these provisions in the system and then you get frustrated and burnt out and wore down and then finally you go to the one that should have provided in the, in the beginning. Um, let's go to 1 John 2. It's kind of an interesting verse. Verses 15 and 16 in the Amplified. It says, Do not love the world of sin that opposes God and his precepts. See, remember, this is the, what the world is. This it's, it's, it opposes God and his precepts, okay? Nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust and sensual cravings of the flesh, and the lust and longing of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, the pretentious confidence in one's resources, or in the stability of earthly things, these do not come from the Father, but are from the world. And it's interesting here in 1 John, John actually lists these three things. It says here, um, for all that is in the world, the lust and sensual cravings of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust and the longing of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. So John recognized these three tactics of the enemy that he uses the world system to operate in, and, um, and then he goes on to say that uh, these do not come the, from the Father, but are from the world system. I'm going to read it out of the, the um, Passion Translation. Do not set the affections of your heart on the world, or in loving the things of the world. Now remember, the world was given to us by God, okay? The world isn't evil. The things that God created aren't evil. What's happened is, because of Genesis 3, the world is broken. And the devil now has the reins to this worldly system that we live in. But thankfully, Jesus said, hey, don't worry about the world. I've overcome the world. If you're going to have tribulation, if that's fine, I've overcome it. Don't worry about the world. I've got that handled. It says the love of the Father and the love of the world are incompatible. We can't love the Father and love the world both. They're not compatible. Okay? For all that the world can offer us, the gratification of our flesh, the allurement of the things of the world, and the obsession with the status and importance, none of these things come from the Father, but from the world. Okay? So we can clearly see that, that Genesis 1 and 2 had none of this involved in it. There were none of these lusts at all in Genesis 1 and 2. They started in Genesis 3, and we see who introduced them into humanity. It's the devil. And, and unfortunately, we have watched him use these tactics through the years very successfully. 
And, and of course, the world and the world system and the people in the world, they really don't have a counterbalance like we do. So that's why it shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't surprise us when the world does worldly things. It just shouldn't surprise us. It, 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 it's not a surprise to me when sinners sin. But when a believer sins, that kind of surprises me because I know that we have all that we need to overcome that. We just have to put it into use, okay? And when we understand the devil's playbook and, and these three arenas that he operates in, we're going to be way more successful at saying no to these tactics. And so, um, so John, you know, in, in these scriptures, John clearly spells out these three temptations and makes us aware of the source of them, the world system and the devil. And so we're going to go look at it. It's interesting because when you, um, or when we, look at Scripture and, and we see the events of Scripture and when we look at life around us, you can almost look at it and pick out which one of these three the person has fallen for. Okay? But it's interesting. There's a story in the Scriptures in, in 2 Samuel 11, and it's King David, okay? And we see in King David's life, in this arena or this portion of his life, where all three of these things took place. I'm going to read it. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they, they uh, ravaged the Amorites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem, it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanliness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite, and Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out from the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all of the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab and servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will do no such thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank, so that he made him drunk. And that evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of the Lord and did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it in the hand of Uriah. So we see here, here's David. He's, he, he should have been out to war. The scripture starts out, says, in the spring of the year time when kings, kings go out to war, go out to battle, here's King David, he's not out there. Okay. And so what do we see? He's now home and everybody else has gone to battle. So here now, I believe he has uh, put together this plan. Because I don't think this is the first time that he has seen this lady bathing. This is the first time he's created the opportunity to do something with what he's seen. So what we see is David looked over and he saw Bathsheba bathing. And so what took place right there? The lust of the eyes. Okay? 
And, and, and the enemy took advantage of that. And at that point, then David decided, well, I want to fulfill my flesh, the lust of his flesh. And he sent his servants down to get Bathsheba. And so he came and he laid with her and she became pregnant. Okay. But then to try and hide his mistake, his pride of life, because it's not going to look good if he's found out that, that he did this thing, he sends for her husband thinking he will come home and lie with her. Then she's pregnant by him and he's off the hook. Okay. But Uriah, being an upright man, God, not dealing in the lust of the flesh, slept at the door of the king. The king even got him drunk. David even got him drunk, thinking, well, certainly he'll go when he's drunk. And he didn't. So then what does David do? He sends Uriah's basically execution letter with him to the front. And the story goes on to say how the letter said to Joab, hey, when you get into battle, put Uriah to the front and all of the rest you pull back so that he will die. And so basically, in essence, David had him murdered. And why did he have him murdered? Because of pride. It wasn't going to look good for the king that he had done such a thing. And, and so here we see all three of these things take place in this story. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And I tell you, when, when you go through scripture and you read it with that view, you will start to see one of those three things show up. Why did, why did Cain kill Abel? It wasn't lust of the flesh. It wasn't lust of the eyes. Pride of life. God received his offering, but not his. He said, hey, I'm not going to put up with that. And out of pride, he killed his brother. And you go on and on and on and on and see uh, all of these things take place uh, in the lives of people. Um, and like I said, I don't, I don't think this is, this is the first time that David had done this. And, and remember, the, the devil's not going to uh, uh, present something to us and we reject it, and then he just leaves. Yeah. He will continue and catch us out of place where we're getting wore down. We, we've kind of pulled away from the Lord a little bit. We've kind of been trying to do things in our own strength, and he'll present it to us again. But thanks be to God, there's no condemnation. You know what, guys? If, if we fall for the trick of the enemy, if, if he's able to deceive us, it is what it is, okay? doesn't change our relationship with God, doesn't make us any more holy, justice, or justified, or righteous. It just means that we, we allowed ourselves to fall for the, the temptation. It's a real thing. And the main thing we have to do is that when we see somebody else that has fallen for the temptation, is that we go and restore them, not condemn them. They don't need to be condemned. They're already condemning themselves. How could I have fallen for such a thing? I know better than this. I've, this has happened to me in the past. But our job is to restore them. Because what you find out is as we extend love and mercy and grace to them, it makes it easier for us to, to, to do it when we have issues. But if we won't extend it to ourselves, we certainly won't extend it to others. Amen? And um, so... The one thing we learn about the devil is he's no respecter of persons. He just isn't. Here it was the king, King David. He didn't say, well, I can't mess with David. He's the king. Sometimes that's one of his greatest targets. What does scripture say? It says if you can, if you can hit the shepherd, you'll scatter the flock. Okay? And, and so God's no respecter, of, or the devil's no respecter of persons. He doesn't care. You know, one of the things in the ministry, and I heard this early on in ministry, and it just, it, it just has stuck with me. You know, the, the grand way that the devil likes to approach a minister, and the three things, and, and they fall in the same category, but a minister is not to touch the gold, the girls, or the glory, okay? And, and if you're a female minister, it's, it's the guys, okay? But if you look at how most ministers fall, it's one of those three areas. They were taking money from the church. They were with the church secretary. Or they puffed themselves up so big that God got put to the background and now they're 
there to build their ministry and not the ministry of the Lord. So, you know, you're not to touch the gold, the girls, or the glory in ministry. Same thing. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. It's the same three categories. Um, and, and so we're going to go look now at um, Matthew 4, 1 through 11. And this is where the devil actually tempted Jesus. See, this goes to show you he's no respecter of persons. And it's an interesting scenario because Jesus had just come in, he had just been baptized, and the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. So now he's been in the wilderness for 40 days, fasting, and, and this temptation comes up. So uh, Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Afterwards, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to experience the ordeal of testing by the accuser, and after fasting for 40 days, Jesus was extremely hungry. Then the tempter came to him and said, How can you possibly be the Son of God and go hungry? Just command these stones to be turned into loaves of bread. Jesus answered, The scriptures say, Bread alone will not satisfy, but the true life is found in every word that consistently goes forth from, the mouth, from God's mouth. Then the accuser transported Jesus to the holy city of Jerusalem and perched him on the highest point of the temple and said to him, If you are really God's son, jump, and the angels will catch you, for it is written in the scriptures, he will command his angels to protect you, and they will lift you up so that you won't even bruise your foot on a rock. Once again, Jesus said to him, The scriptures say you must never put the Lord your God to the test. And the third time the accuser lifted Jesus up into a very high mountain range and showed him all the kingdom of the world and all the splendor that goes with it. All of these kingdoms I will give you, the accuser said, if only you will kneel down before me and worship me. But Jesus said, go away, Satan, for the scripture says, kneel before the Lord your God and worship only him. And at once the accuser left him and the angel suddenly gathered around Jesus to minister to his needs. And it's interesting that in, in verse 4, so Jesus is hungry, he's in the wilderness, the devil comes along and says, hey, turn these stones into bread. And it's interesting, if you think about, here's Jesus, he's hungry, he's been fasting for 40 days, and we see at this point, Jesus is humanity, he's hungry. And so the devil tries to bring the lust of the eyes, well, look at these stones. And if, and if you think about stones, there are certain stones that would look like a loaf of bread. They're just big and round and sizable enough that it could be a loaf of bread. And, and he says, you know, why don't you turn these into bread so that you can fulfill your need? You're God's son. Why are you going hungry? So what he tried to do is to twist and distort what God was doing in the life of Jesus and get him... Uh, to once again fall for this lust, to take what was natural and pervert it, okay? Here's what we have to learn, is that what did Jesus do that Adam and Eve didn't do? Jesus relied on what the Father had said. And so, what does Jesus say out of Deuteronomy? He quotes the scriptures. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, think about what God had just said to him 40 days earlier when he was baptized. He said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Okay? So Jesus knew that he didn't have to do anything to please the Father. He knew his relationship with his Father was good. And we need to know that. That's part of us knowing that we're righteous. We're in right standing with God because out of that standing is when we proclaim the scriptures ourselves with boldness. When we know we're right with God, we can proclaim the promises of God with boldness and not shrink back, thinking that part of it lies on us. See, when I was speaking the word of God over my son, I wasn't even remotely taken into any of the, the um, portion of it how my life had been lived. Because the promises aren't according to how I live. 
Should I live uprightly? Yes. But the word of God is the word of God because of Jesus, not because of me. Okay? And that's what Jesus knew is that I don't have to do this because, first of all, it's not what God's called me to do. This is a deception that you're trying to trick me or tempt me into doing to get me off of what God's wanting me to do uh, on behalf of humanity. Um, so he knew that his, his father was well pleased with him. There was no need for him to do this stuff. And so here's this natural desire that Jesus would have had, and it would have been strong. He's hungry. He's fasted for 40 days, okay? Did Jesus have the ability to turn the stones into bread? Of course he did. We watched him take a fish and a couple loaves and, and feed the multitude. So we know he had the capability, but what he did was he turned to his father and his father's word that said that, hey, you don't have to live by this bread. You live by what comes out of my mouth, okay? And so uh, the devil tried to take what was natural, twist it, and turn it into a lust, and that's what he does with us. Um, the next thing is we see that, that he goes on, he takes him up to, this, to the temple and says, hey, why don't you jump off? And the angels will protect you. They'll, they'll catch you and guard you. And, and the people will see that, that you know, you're supernatural and that God's with you. And, and they'll worship you because of that. But remember, Jesus didn't come to be worshipped. He came to make the Father known. See, and this would have, would have twisted and, and perverted what the Father's plan was for Jesus and his work uh, to show the Father and the love of the Father. And, and so, once again, what did he do? He spoke the word. But isn't it interesting, the devil took the word of God, twisted it just a little bit, spoke it. Jesus knew that wasn't the right rendition of what the scripture said in Deuteronomy and, and quoted it back to him and said, hey, you don't put, your Lord to, don't put the Lord God to the test. And so he once again, by quoting the scripture, overcame the temptation. He overcame the temptation by that. Um, let's go to Matthew 4. Oh, excuse me, that's where I was at, Matthew 4, uh, 6 and 7. That's where, where he, he wants him to jump. And um, he says he'll command his angels to protect you and to lift you up so that you won't even bruise your foot on a rock. Once again, Jesus said to him, the scriptures say. You know, and, and it's interesting, we, we kind of start to see this pattern that Jesus is putting forth. And it's the same pattern that we need to apply in our situations. When the enemy comes in and tries to distort or twist, we need to know the scriptures and speak the scripture over our situation. Okay, life and death are in the power of the tongue and you'll eat the fruit thereof. When we speak the word of God over our situation, it's what strengthens us. It's what gives us the ability to say no to the temptation and, and live that upright and godly life. Amen. Um, so Jesus knew it wasn't in the plans of the Father to do this and he was on, he was on track. And so then in Matthew 8... It says, in the third time, the accuser lifted Jesus up into a very high mountain range and showed him the kingdom of the world and the splendor that goes with it. And, of course, this splendor was the splendor that the devil saw in the world because he now had the title deed to the world. Adam and Eve have kind of created high trees and sold it out to him. And I found it interesting is in this one, when the devil said, hey, I can give you all of these kingdoms, Jesus didn't say, you don't own these kingdoms. He knew, but he also knew that in a very short time they were going to be taken away from him. That he was going to go pay the price and redeem all of this back to humanity and take the power and the authority away from the devil and give it back to humanity where it went. And he says, all these kingdoms I will give you, the accuser said, only if you kneel down before me and worship me. But Jesus said, and I love this, go away, Satan. That ought to be one of our first go-tos when the temptations come, go away, Satan. I see your plan. I see what you're trying to do here. I see how you're trying to take me off track of what the Father's called me to do. Just go away. 
And, and uh, go away, Satan, and once again, what does he use? He uses the scripture. Kneel before the Lord your God and worship him only. And the accuser at once left him, and the angel suddenly gathered around Jesus to minister to his needs. And um, so, so the devil had the authority. Jesus never, never argued that. He just knew that the plan of God wasn't to get the authority back this way. This wasn't the way God had planned it. Um, and so he said, hey, be gone. Just be gone. Let's go to James. There's an interesting scripture here in James. And, and the reason I like this scripture is because it's very clear for us, uh, the author of the temptations. James 1, 13 through 16. It says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempteth no man. Okay, but each man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed, and then the lust, when it has conceived, or when we have, have given in to it, bears sin, and the sin then, when full grown, bears forth death. Be not deceived, my beloved brethren. And so James is saying, listen, don't let anyone tell you this is from God. Every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father above, in who there is no variable or changing. He's not one way one day and one way another way. God is the Alpha and the Omega. He's, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, okay? So when we start to get this thought process, or when the enemy tries to get us to believe that, that the Father is tempting us or the Father is testing us, James tells us, don't go there. The, he can't be tempted, and he tempts no man, okay? Temptation comes from the devil and him alone. The reason that we have to know that is so that we turn to God for the strength and for the answer to the temptation. But if we think that maybe he's got a part to play in it, how do you go to him? I've never understood people that don't believe that God heals but then they're praying to him for healing. There's just a confliction there that I don't understand. If you think that God has, has made you sick or somebody sick, then why would you pray to heal them? Because it's the will of God for them to be sick. So if you think God's not going to heal them, then he's, he's schizophrenic. God doesn't know what he's doing. He's making them sick and healing them. Thankfully, we don't have a God like that. Amen. But religion teaches there a God like that. But these scriptures like this that are so clear that, that God doesn't tempt us. He's not the source of our temptation. But what does it also say that we're tempted by our own lust? That's a natural thing, perverted. Okay. Does God want us to have a house, have a place to live? Absolutely he does. But the devil will come along and say, hey, you need that eight-bedroom, eight-bathroom house. Well, see, the pride of life will show up right there, so you can walk around and say, hey, you haven't happened to see my house, did you? It's big. It's awesome. You know? And, and so we just have to know that, that God gave us these natural desires. We're to have them in context, use them in context, and not let the enemy uh, take them out of context for us. Romans 13 and 14 in the Amplified says, But close yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for or even think about gratifying the flesh regard to its improper desires. See, and that's what the world system tries to do for us is to get these natural desires and make them improper. Amen. You know, it, it's, it's like... Uh, for example, I would love to see more people in these seats, okay? Not for my sake, but for the sake of people learning the Word of God, being set free from this bondage that the Word of God will set you free from. That's natural. What's not natural is me wanting to see it full so that I can boast that there's a big church. 
See what I'm saying? And, and, but that's what the enemy tries to do with us is to take those things and distort them. You know, it might be a situation where, hey, you and I need transportation back and forth to work and to the grocery store and so on and so forth. But because of the pride of life, we may go buy a vehicle that's way outside of our means. And now we don't own the vehicle. The vehicle owns us. Okay, and we're literally slaves to the vehicle or slaves to the house or slaves to whatever it is that's really out of context for where we should be at. Amen. And then what happens is, is you, you, you can't make the payments and you're crying out to God. And thankfully, for by his grace and mercy, he shows up and helps us. You know what I'm saying? So here the scripture in Romans says that we need to clothe ourselves, which means that we need to see ourselves in Christ. We need to see ourselves with all of the, the promises being yes and amen in Christ. We're clothed in him. We don't see ourselves in our natural man. We see ourselves by the spirit man. We walk in that spiritual man and we're made strong by that. Here's the, I'm going to end with this scripture. It's a great scripture. Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize, sympathize with our understanding or our weaknesses and temptations, but one who has been tempted, knowing exactly how it feels to be human, in every respect as we are, yet without committing any sin. So we're told that we have this throne of grace that we can come to in our time of need. Okay, it's a throne of grace. It's not a throne of condemnation. It's not a throne of works. It's not a throne of you get your act together and then come see me. It's a throne of grace, a throne of mercy that we can find grace in our time of need. And who's sitting on that throne but the Lord Jesus Christ who understands what we go through. The scripture tells us in his humanity, he was tempted, but thankfully, he didn't give in to the temptation and was able to live a sinless life. But when we look back at his temptations, what do we see as kind of the basis of, of what he did? He knew the word of God, he knew his father, and he spoke over the situation. That's why it's imperative that we know what scripture says First of all, about who our enemy is, what his tactics are, how he operates, that's what we're learning today, and then also who our father is, how he operates, what he's done for us, who our high priest is, and who it is we get to come to in those times of need. Because you know what? It's going to be in our lifetime. We're not going to go past some certain mark marker in our Christian walk that all of a sudden the enemy says, well... You know, they got 100,000 miles on their Christian odometer now. I can't bother them anymore. Things happen in our lives. As, as we walk along and our, and our lives go along and year by year, some of the, te I mean, you, you and I all know that some of the things that he tempted with us years ago, he doesn't even, because we don't even, we don't even, it's not even a thing anymore to us. But now there's new things that come along, Okay. You know, you might have lived healthy all this, and all of a sudden now you're getting to a certain age, and he comes along and says, yeah, now's when you're going to start needing a doctor. Now's when your body will start falling apart. Look at Jenny, look at this, look at Billy, look at Bobby. I mean, they're all in the hospital. You're the next one. What are you going to say to that? No, I'm going up the mountain like Moses did. I'm not falling apart. Thanks be to God, he's provided for me. I don't have to do all of that. And so when we, when we keep in step with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will not make provisions for the flesh, okay? The Holy Spirit will always lead us to God and his provisions. And that's the key is to be in tune with the Spirit of God. You know, I, like I talked about earlier, Proverbs 6, 2 says we're snared by the words of our mouths. Proverbs 18, 21 says life and death are in the power of the tongue and we eat the fruit of it. And I'm going to end with this. We can change our world by changing our words. Literally. We can change our world by changing our words, and what we do is we change our words to line up with what God says. 
we agree with what he says about us. But how are we going to know that until we get into the word of God? And, and that's why me, as, as a teacher, I want you guys to learn the word of God. We don't have a high priest system like they had in the old covenant where you had to go to the high priest to get your needs met. I want you guys to be so strong in the word of God and the comprehension of the word of God and the understanding of the word of God that when you're in your situation, whether it's at work or at home or on the highway or wherever it's at, and the enemy comes in, you know the word to speak over the situation. You need to know the word. Now, is it wrong to call somebody and say, hey, I'm struggling this with, can you give me a scripture? You know, today, in today's age, I'm telling you, there's so many things I just Google. Scripture on such and such. Scripture on depression. Scripture on poverty. Scripture on this. I mean, it's amazing what we have access to, but we also have to understand that we have to believe that the God of the Scripture is the God same yesterday, today, and forever. And that his word is alive and active. And it's working on our behalf. See, that's our part, is to believe it. That's why we're called believers. Amen. We need to believe it. And, and you know what? I don't, it's not a problem to, to link arms with somebody that's walked through a situation like that. You know, scripture tells us that which you've been comforted in, you can now comfort others. Because you've watched God work in that arena, you've got a testimony of God, how it worked, how God worked in the situation. You, you, you probably now have scriptures that have been, have been embedded into that situation that you spoke over that situation that you can share with people. Amen? Because life's going to happen. The question is how we deal with life as it happens, how we respond to it. That's right. Father, we thank you this morning as you have clearly shown in your word the way the enemy will try to distort and twist and take all of the many wonderful things that you've given us and, and try and get us to take it out of context. Father, we know that he comes with the lust of the eyes, he comes with the lust of our flesh, and he also tries to get us to rise up in pride. But Father, we know that Jesus came and he overcame all of those temptations, gave us the plumb line by which to, to build on. And today we, we thank you that by the Holy Spirit, we're learning and growing and comprehending on how to lay those stones one on top of another to make our temple strong, to make our building strong. And it's through the word of God. It's through the righteous word of God that we, we walk and talk and operate. So I thank you this morning as we learn and grow um, that we, we say no to the devil and to those tactics. We say yes to you, Father God, and to the things that you're doing on our behalf. And we thank you that it all comes as a free gift through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. If anybody needs prayer for something, come and see me or don't leave here without having somebody pray for you. Um, thank you. You guys are the best God's got. <laughs>